and welcome to Why Projects Succeed. I'm Chet Haas from the Android Graphics team. And I'm Romain Guy from the Android Toolkit team. And we are happy to be here for this event for Ukraine. We hope you enjoy this talk and we hope you enjoy the other talks for the event. Uh, and why don't we get started? So uh, first of all, let's start with a little animation here. We want to take a look at some of the aspects of Android's history since it started back in 2003. Uh, and see what we can learn from Android's development and apply to other projects. What is it about certain projects that allow them to succeed, or in some cases, not? Um, so first of all, a little word from our sponsor. A lot of the ideas behind this talk came from a book that came out last summer called Androids, the team that... And by book that came out, you mean book that you wrote. Oh, yeah, coincidentally, <laughs> I, I happen to publish this thing. Uh, Android's the team that built the Android operating system. Uh, the, it's not currently available. It will be by the time this comes out. It'll be available in print and ebook form as well as audiobook form. Uh, all profits from the book are going to tech related charities. And first of all, let's talk about history. Right. And when we mean history, we mean what happened uh, with Android before Google. Uh, so very few of you might know that, that Android started as a company that was targeting not smartphones, but digital cameras. It was in 2003, and digital cameras were becoming a thing. They were becoming useful. They were becoming powerful. But unfortunately, the software back then, you know, on those low-powered devices, was still pretty bad. The UI in particular was horrible. The networking wasn't really there. So the idea of Andy Rubin and Chris White was to create this new photo farm company that would build an open source platform, an open source operating system for those digital cameras. And the key here is that they already had in mind to build an open source operating system. Those ideas came from their prior experience. They worked together at, uh, at Danger. It was a company that built a phone that was extremely popular in the US in the early 2000s called the T-Mobile Sidekick. It was one of the first internet-oriented devices with built-in chat and uh, other like e email programs and stuff like that. But of course, uh, digital cameras were you know, becoming more powerful, but they were not quite ready yet for something like this. So there was an idea by them that we should do this camera thing. There was an idea by everybody else in the world that wouldn't phones be interesting. So in particular, Rich Miner, who had worked with Andy previously with some of the Danger work, uh, and Nick Sears, who worked at T-Mobile, which was the launch partner for the Danger phones, approached Andy separately and said, we'd be really interested in working with you if you want to do phones. And Andy said, I don't want to do phones. I already did phones. I'm done with phones. I want to focus on this camera thing. But VCs weren't interested. He couldn't get the funding for uh, that kind of company. And so he did bring up the idea at a couple of these VC meetings, and the ears in the room perked up. Because it turns out that VCs mostly want to make money. That is actually their number one job. And they could see how to do that in the phone market. They couldn't really see that for cameras. So this introduced the idea that maybe he may not want to work on phones, but maybe that was the way to go. You know, when you said that their ears perked up, it sounds like you're reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe, maybe after working on it for four years, maybe I just memorized everything I wrote from reading it too many times. So Rick and uh, Rich and Nick joined as co-founders, uh, and they helped work on the business plan for this company, Android, uh, to figure out what they needed to do to actually approach the phone market. Uh, and so they managed to convince Andy. And in 2005, they started going around to uh, VCs with this new pitch deck that you can see here on screen. It's a couple of slides from the original pitch deck. And the idea here was to look at the smartphone market or the, the emerging smartphone market and the phone market and realizing that there were way more phones out there than there were of PCs. And more importantly, more phones were being sold than PCs were being sold. On top of that, the hardware of phones was becoming way more capable, right? Some of those phones were starting to have GPUs and bigger screens and touch screens. Not the touch screens we know today, but touch screens nonetheless. Um, and for OEMs, for manufacturers, they could either expensively create their own operating system or turn to Linux, for instance, or open platform. The problem there is that you didn't get a complete end-to-end -end vertical solution ready to use. You got a bunch of libraries and components that you had to assemble. It was still a lot of work to build something good for the user. So in the meantime, uh, Google, this little company, uh, just IPO the year before, so in, two th in 2004, and Gmail was just coming out. Uh, and so the team uh, started talking to that company. 
that company as well as VCs in the area. So they approach VCs again. However, they approach VCs on the East Coast, VCs that hadn't already turned down Android for that, that camera idea before. And a couple of the companies said, yes, actually, we find that very interesting. And here's some term sheets. We will give you some small amount of money. And at the same time, they were having these ongoing meetings with Google. And Google said, not only would we like to work with you, but why don't we just acquire you and uh, cut out the middleman here and, and sort of see what we can do to help this thing ship. All right, so what did Google actually buy? They So I saw some discussions online on some, I don't know, Reddit or uh, review thing or whatever, where people said, well, you know, Google bought this company and then they just shipped that phone that that company had. This is like the opposite of what actually happened. What Google acquired was eight people that were working on this project, one of whom was an admin. There were the four founders that we mentioned, and then there were like three to five engineers working on this thing, right? But the people that actually came into Google were just those eight. So three engineers, four founders, and an admin, and an idea. The code that they actually had was not a product, it was a demo. Yeah, but there was some code, right? Uh, and you can show us what the code looked like, or at least what the result of the code looked like. Yes, so this is basically what they bought. Uh, they bought a desktop-based demo that showed what a phone might look like if it was running software a little bit like what they had in mind. You can see that the software looks nothing like what Android looked like when it finally well, also came Also, how did they write that demo? Uh, JavaScript. JavaScript, right. the, the, the language of the future. Uh, so uh, there was a comment by Wei Huang, one of the early engineers on the team, that basically when he arrived, he took a look at the original code of Android and he realized, wow, this company got bought for 3,000 lines of JavaScript code. Nice job. Uh, but the important thing that they had was they had the idea. They wanted this open source platform. It was going to have certain important capabilities for smartphones, and open source enabled it to be usable by all these other companies in the world. Uh, so they basically had the plan. They had the, the, a good, strong team to start with, and then the ideas of how to build that team and build the product as they run. So Google acquired not much in terms of code. Um, and so that's when, in 2005, the long road to 1.0 that would happen in 2008 started. So what, does it, what did it mean for Google to, uh, to build towards 1.0? So first, the team needed to build a kernel and a set of drivers. So they turned toward the Linux kernel, but they still had to build their own drivers for a number of components that would go uh, in the phone. Uh, they had to provide some sort of programming language. At first, they actually thought, well, we've got JavaScript to start with, so maybe that's one of the languages, but why don't we also do C++, which was really popular with embedded developers and some of the people on that early team. And what about that Java programming language? Because a lot of developers understood that. At some point, they realized, wait, we have like 15 people on the team, and we're talking about supporting three different programming languages. Why don't we just go for one? So they decided on the Java programming language as the official language to support for Android, but then they needed to actually build a runtime for that to actually make it work on the devices. And of course, to build applications, you need more than just a runtime in languages. You need a framework. You need a UI toolkit. You need APIs, graphics, media. You need a system UI for the user. So that was where a large part of the team was focusing on, right? They had to build all those components that now form the APIs that you use when you build applications. They had to have applications themselves. So they had the original idea for external developers to be able to write some applications. But they also needed to provide some core applications. Google, at that time, as, as today, has several applications that people are used to using in their normal daily lives, and they wanted to provide access to those applications on this new platform that would be out there. Well, it turns out those application departments inside of Google had zero interest in writing those apps for this platform that essentially didn't exist in the world yet. So the Android team was building things like the Gmail application and the calendar application and uh, Maps capability and contacts and all this stuff internally as well. And then we need a bunch of services. An operating system is not just APIs, it's not just applications. You need the applications to be able to talk to the system itself, so uh, to interact with notifications, for instance, or to power the OTS, or to give you access to the, to the calendar or the contacts data, or the window manager, right? So you can create windows and move them on screen. So again, a lot of work was built in those layers uh, so that the applications could be more interesting. And as I said before, they also wanted external developers to be able to, be able to build just as powerful powerful applications, so they needed to build Android Market, which was eventually renamed to the Play Store, so that there would be a market uh, a application site where developers could actually easily upload and sell their applications. 
And finally, we need an SDK that meant documentation, a compiler for the resource system, an emulator, a plugin for an ID. Back then, the SDK was relying on the Eclipse uh, Java ID. You know, all the things that you need to be able to successfully build an application from your desktop. And then right in the middle of the run-up to 1.0, so it started in mid-2005 and ended in 2008 when 1.0 shipped. But in 2007, in January, the iPhone was announced. And then in June of that year, the iPhone launched. Now, at that time, nobody outside of Google, and in fact, most of the people inside of Google didn't even know that Android existed. There was no SDK at that time. So it was, all the attention was focused on this new smartphone that came out. In particular, it helped define one of the things that would be a checkbox item that all future smartphones needed to add, which was touchscreen capability. Now, the iPhone didn't invent this capability. This had been on various form factors. In fact, some smartphones uh, before this phone, but they did define some of the dynamics about how this needed to work. And that, in the eyes of consumers as well as manufacturers, became something necessary that smartphone platforms needed to have. Now. Simultaneously, Android had two devices that were actually in the pipeline. The first one was called Sooner because it was going to come out. Sooner. Clever naming, right? Uh, they, we're good at that. Th <laughs> this was going to be an easier and faster device to come out with because it was not going to have touchscreen capability, so they didn't need to refine that feature. Instead, that was going to come out in the second device, which was called Dream. Uh, so the Sooner device was going to be the launch device, and they decided that they needed to pivot at that time, that instead of waiting for the touchscreen capability, that touchscreen capability really needed to be in the first device. Otherwise, they were basically going to be competing against the BlackBerry market and not this new smartphone market that was constantly evolving. And so they killed the first device, the Sooner, and they focused everything on the second device, the Dream device, and they went from there. And then finally, in uh, the fall of that year, uh, in October-ish, then the public SDK first came out for Android, and now the wide world knew what Android was, and they had initial versions of the SDK and the APIs that they could play with. And now if we hand wave a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, very short <laughs> nights, the team made it. At the end of 2008, Android 1.0 came out. It came out with the first Android device ever, the T-Mobile G1. So it was specific to the US market and specific to the T-Mobile carrier. But at the same time, the team also uh, released the source code of the entire platform as open source. Anybody back then could download the source code of the platform, build it on their own machine, and flash their T-Mobile G1 to install their own customized version of Android. So amazing. The G1 is out there, and Android is out there, public SDK 1.0. Everything's good. Open source, uh, the future is golden, right? So this is what the numbers look like at the time. So all the way through 2009, you see the green line at the bottom, at the very, very bottom, below everything else, basically horizontal at zero. That's Android. That's the adoption of devices in the world through most of 2000. Yeah, I remember being in the meeting room with the entire team because the team was pretty small back then and we were cheering because we had reached 50,000 users of Android. <laughs> Drop in the bucket. And the rest of those lines on the screen, that was the rest of the competition, right? So you have Nokia flying way above, including owning like 70% of the feature phone market, as well as various flavors of smartphones. And you had you know, Microsoft with their offerings out there. And you had all the other players, BlackBerry, incredibly loyal user base with those devices. And you had iPhone sort of launch and then just kind of start going consistently up from there, and then you had Android at the bottom. So what's going on there? Well, at the end of 2009, then the Droid launch, which really started to change things, and then after the Droid, other manufacturers kicked in. So this is what it looked like in about mid-2010 uh, when I joined the team. So it started to tick up a little bit because of the Droid sales, and it just kind of kept going from there. And then over the next year, this is what I saw happen was the beginning of what we called the hockey stick, where once Droid was out there and consumers sort of bought in in a really big way into this new platform, and then other manufacturers basically everywhere bought in, then all the new devices started to come out, and the line went way up, and nobody really talked about numbers anymore because it just wasn't a very interesting conversation. And then if you look a couple of years in the future, there's also an interesting dynamic with feature phones. So at that time, like around the time that Android launched, if you wanted a cheap phone, you would get a feature phone. It gave you phone call capability and it gave you texting. And that's really all you wanted. If you were trying to save money, you spent, you know, 50 bucks on a phone and you spent not much on, you know, nothing on a data plan and not much on a phone plan. And this was the way to save money while being something, uh, while having a way to communicate with people. But a couple of years later, 
through a combination of the capability of these smartphones and the things that you could do with this amazing device in your pocket, as well as all the competition, all the devices out there brought the prices down in terms of what the phones cost as well as what the carrier plans cost, then people were all of a sudden choosing Android phones instead of feature phones. And then that dynamic just kept going from there. So the point of all that history was to sort of look at some of the dynamics of how Android developed over the years. But we can then draw lessons from that development and we can say, okay, what is it about the way that Android went about things that allowed that project to succeed? And what can we learn from that for software or hardware projects in general? And Android is a particularly interesting example because I think you touched upon that earlier, earlier when you said that not many people believed in the project. And it made sense, right? Android was a really small team. We're talking about like less than 100 people maybe when we launched Android 1.0. Uh, and we were going against you know, Nokia and BlackBerry, like this huge market of existing manufacturers and ecosystems. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was not guaranteed that Android would become what it is today. So. First, uh, it's what we call vision. You have to know what you're aiming at and you have to carry through. So Android is an interesting use case because remember it was called Photo Farm and it started for digital cameras. Obviously there was a big pivot there because it ended up being a, an open source platform for phones and for actually more than phones nowadays. We have you know, tablets and cars and, and wearable devices and so on. But the key is that it remained an open source platform. It started as an open source platform for you know, a computing uh, base of hardware, and it remained an open source platform just for a different hardware base. Uh, so, and on top of that, the idea was always to build a product and a platform. So there was the platform, but we make the platform successful. The Android team was heavily involved in defining some of the products, so the T-Mobile G1, for instance, or then the Nexus devices. And now they were still doing this with the Pixel line. So, Actually, one of the, uh, a side note here that's um, although the original idea was we want to ship cameras and everybody said we don't want you to and we want you to ship phones uh, instead. Well, given the integration of cameras and the importance of cameras in all of these smartphone devices, you could say that he actually succeeded with the original plan that uh, just that you know Andy roundabout way. Had. Yeah, <laughs> so so there. got there eventually. Took a little bit longer. Uh, another area is focus, the ability for the team to just focus on what the goal is and not get torn in so many ways, which is especially difficult at large companies with many, many different products. Um, so one of the interesting dynamics in the team at the time was they were really kept very separate from the larger company. They were acquired as a very small acquisition and they started to build the team. But as they built the team, those people on the team were really internally focused on Android and Android's priorities, be they hardware or software or platform or whatever. Leadership dealt with Google, that was fine, but everybody else only dealt with Android. And this allowed the team to build really a startup mentality that allowed them to um, focus just on what they needed to succeed, not necessarily long-term goals of Google, but instead all the efforts, all the incredibly hard work at that time allowed them to just drive towards these really tight deadlines that they had. And then having the right people was key. So the founders of Android had experience building smartphones. They had this experience of shipping hardware products. So they knew what it took. They knew the industry. They knew the right people. And then the, the, the folks who joined the team early on had worked on operating systems before. Some of them had worked on Palm OS, for instance, so on mobile operating systems. Some of them had worked on desktop operating systems like BOS or even for the, uh, for the first Xbox. The key is they, they knew what to do and it gave them an idea of where the industry was going. If you look at the APIs in Android 1.0, you can see that we had all the APIs needed to support multiple sizes of screens, multiple densities of screens, because the folks who were building the platform had been in this industry long enough to know that this is where the, the world was going, and they were able to anticipate some of it. Of course, you know, they could not anticipate everything. There's only you know, 24 hours in a day, but that was really, really incredibly helpful. And the key is that, um, the team would choose people who would fit the project, not necessarily the company. So, you know, folks came from all different backgrounds that did not necessarily have like college degrees for some of them who ended up being extremely successful at Google. Uh, the key was if you had something to bring to the project and you know what you were doing, you were the right person for the project. So the open source idea was not just a whim, it was an opportunity for the team to provide a platform that other companies would want to adopt. One of the really difficult things in having a platform that you need other people or want other people to use is, why would those other people buy into your vision? 
right? So if they're going to license your operating system like they did for things like Windows Mobile, that means they're going to pay a per handset cost, which is a lot of money, and that is a very hard decision for them. Uh, so they would like to avoid paying uh, a licensing fee, um, certainly. But more importantly, then they, they also need to buy into the vision of what is this company doing? What is that department doing? Where is the platform going? And in general, they did not want to do this. The folks that came from Palm OS uh, and uh, Palm Source knew this from experience where they had developed a platform and they approached manufacturers and manufacturers had zero interest in taking on that platform because they did not know where the company and the platform was going. So they preferred to do the work themselves because then they could actually trust where this thing was going in the future. Whereas if you have an open source platform like Android is, then it really doesn't matter because that company over there, you know, maybe they like where you're going with this open source platform, but they don't need to care because if your company goes away, if this, if this software goes off into left field somewhere, they still have the software through open source and they can take it in a different direction if they need to. And it was that dynamic of open source that allowed all the manufacturers around the world to say, yes, we believe in this vision because we don't need to believe in where the company is going. We can actually see the code and take it and do what we need to with it. So we mentioned that the team was small. We mentioned that there was a lot to do to get to Android 1.0. Remember, like from the kernel all the way to the SDK, we had to build pretty much everything. Uh, and on top of that, the competition was really heating up, right? Like through the iPhone, but also through all the companies that were doing an amazing job back then, uh, like Microsoft or BlackBerry or Nokia. Um, so unfortunately, crunch times happen, and the success of Android, because it was not guaranteed, the future of Android, the project and the team was also not guaranteed. So the entire team, you know, through like, this, this core loyalties through the focus that they had, uh, sometimes, you know, poured like their heart and soul into the work. And unfortunately that meant like, you know, we worked maybe a little harder than we were supposed to. Uh, thankfully it didn't last. So, you know, the, the first year, especially 2007, 2008 was really difficult because we were aiming for that 1.0, right? And there was so much to do. Uh, but then we eased up a little bit. And as we got closer and closer to having very stable foundations, so all the way to 2010, like those crunches like, you know, became more and more rare and uh, hopefully they will not happen uh, ever again. So, you know, the key is like, it all, of course depends on the project, but when the survival of the team, when the survival of the project is at stake, like those crunch times may happen and they might be necessary. Uh, it's best if you can avoid them, but. Just be aware, yeah, just stay away from the death march. We've, I think we've all been there and it's, it's not a pleasant place to be. Just make sure there, there's limited um, envelopes of those times if they need to take place. Uh, so uh, another thing is competition is good in a couple of ways. One, uh, the obvious one is innovation is spawned by competition, right? So the fact that there's a competitor out there doing better, doing a little bit worse, running beside you, like it doesn't matter. You see them out there, you see what uh, about their, their um, user base is really interesting, uh, features that, that people want or capabilities, like inspires uh, other companies to innovate on their own and say, okay, what can we do to make sure that our users are happy as well? All of that's really wonderful. The other one is not as obvious. Uh, the fact that the iPhone entered the market with that really strong competition of the iPhone before Android was even out there, like I think the assumption of everybody is, wow, that competition is going to be tough. And it was, and it still is. It's really good products, it's a really good company, knows how to uh, ship these uh, consumer electronics devices really well, all of that true. On the other hand, they actually created an opportunity because there is one company that succeeded from the hardware uh, efforts of that device, and that company is Apple or some of the chip companies that they worked with. If you were not one of those very small handful of companies, then you were basically cut out of those opportunities overall. And same thing with carriers. They opened with one carrier in each market. In the US, it was AT&T. So if you're another carrier like Verizon or T-Mobile, what are you gonna do? You want to compete. You want a smartphone, and now you can't be part of that thing. So what else are you going to do? That created the opportunity for Android at the time when Android was just coming out with its uh, its platform. It was not done yet, but it was clear that it could make it there and it could make it in time. And so that created, it opened the door for all of those companies to then come to Google and say, oh, what do you got cooking? Because we don't have anything that's going to be able to succeed in this market in time. 
And of course, you have to just keep going, right? I mentioned that we hit Android 1.0, but that was not enough. There was still so much to do. We had to make so many cuts to get to 1.0. Uh, and I think an example also early on was the idea of having this Swinner device without a touchscreen. Building touchscreens was always part of the plan, but you know, when you have limited resources and limited time, you can't do everything all at once. You have to go, you have to take baby steps. And of course, hitting 1.0 and you know, starting becoming successful uh, was not enough. And we've seen that, you know, competition is tough in this market. And if you, uh, if you stop innovating, if you stop uh, working hard and if you stop improving your product, someone else will take your place. Um, so Android did not stop at 1.0, it did not, did not stop at the G1. And still not stopping today, we're still releasing a new version of Android every year. It comes out you know, with new features every year. We've expanded to new uh, uh, markets and new devices. So I mentioned tablets and cars and wearables, and I'm sure there are other things. And I'm always surprised when I see companies that put you know, Android in the fridge or where I can it seems to be everywhere nowadays. Uh, it's always surprising knowing how it started. I, I was looking at the graph thinking, you know, the, the main lesson here is you just keep going, oh, look at that really long stretch of time where nothing existed, and then even after it existed, they just had to keep going knowing that maybe in the future we can, we can be relevant. The other option is just arrive at the right time. So I arrived, uh, you know, halfway through 2010, which is really where the uptick was, was starting. So that was, yeah, you know, convenient obviously for me. Obviously, thanks to you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, also, ship something. So there's this great quote from Ficus uh, from the book where it's more important that you ship something rather than that you spend that time, you know, back in the office trying to perfect those APIs and come out with the perfect solution because while you are doing that, someone else is going to ship something instead. The fact that Android was able to actually hit the mark and ship in the very small window of opportunity that they had after the iPhone had launched and before something else was able to come out there and, and capture attention meant that they were able to succeed and be relevant even today, right? If instead they had spent time going, you know, how can we make these APIs better? then maybe uh, we wouldn't be here doing this presentation today, right? So there are certainly rough edges in the results that came out in 1.0, but it's good that we now have the opportunity to smooth those edges out over time because the team was able to actually ship something instead of you know, continuing to perfect and then becoming irrelevant very quickly. And timing, that's my favorite one, because when Chet interviewed a bunch of people for the book, he asked, you know, folks who were around uh, for Android 1.0, like, why did you th do you think that the project succeeded? And everybody, including myself, I think, had the same answer, which, which was, we were at the right place uh, at the right time. Uh, it's something you can't control. You can be aware of what's happening, right? Like the team knew that smartphones and, and phones were becoming more important. The hardware was becoming more powerful. So you could see the trend and you could try to uh, to ride that wave a little bit. But for instance, there's no way that the team could have predicted, for instance, the arrival of the iPhone or so, some of the other market changes that happened back then. Uh, you also need to be able to react really quickly in a tight, tight window. So for instance, again, when the iPhone showed up, like, you know, we had to change our hardware plans and discard sooner so that we could move faster. Or even before that, when the team decided to go from cameras to phones. Um, so being in the right place at the right time, you know, part of it uh, is, is something you control, is something you can kind of aim for. But it's never going to be 100% certain. Uh, that's, that part is left to luck. Yeah, so closer related to timing is that element of luck. Sometimes something succeeds because of things beyond you. So great, take credit for you know, having worked really hard and you've got good ideas, although maybe also realize that there were a lot of other good people and good ideas out there that didn't happen to succeed just given various dynamics of the market and, and technology that we couldn't all control. On the other hand, maybe you are working like I have in most of my career on projects that were not as successful and that's okay too because again, there is that element of luck that maybe didn't turn in your favor that time. Maybe the most important thing that you can do at that point is to recognize, okay, well, that one didn't work. What else can I do? So you pick yourself up and you go and you do it well, again. Actually, what's very interesting is that a lot of the folks on the early uh, Android team, like, like we said before, had worked on things like you know BOS or Web TV. They had worked on other products uh, like Android or operating systems that you know made it to market, but never found the success that Android, Android found. So it's exactly what you said, Chad. Right? Like you have to try again. And usually behind a success, there's also a lot of you know failures. Uh, this is kind of a negative way of, of, of going to those projects because they were not exactly failures. Uh, but necessarily succeed like out of the blue.
uh, every time. And in fact, one of the elements that contributed to Android being able to go so quickly from nothing to 1.0 was the fact that all of those early people on the team came in with all of those uh, experiences where maybe those things didn't succeed, but they built up a lot of skills and knowledge and experience and, uh, and team dynamics working with each other that allowed them to happen to uh, succeed to the extent that Android has this time around. That is the presentation. Thanks for watching, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you.